Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anna Anario, and I'm part of the team here who makes the park forums. Uh, this summer, we entered our 49th year here at Park. And in case you're wondering what we do here, we do many types of research from machine learning to human-machine collaboration, industrial IoT, and researching on connecting the digital and physical worlds. Today, we're going to be listening to Sunil Nagaraj, and he'll be talking about software engineering tool chain and powerful software development um, as it's being applied conceptually and tactically to enable smart hardware in the real world. He'll use examples with machine learning, um, as well as how it connects the dots and navigates our complex physical world. He's a managing partner at Ubiquity Ventures, and he looks, he looks to invest in software behind, sorry, sorry, software beyond the screen startups. He spent six years as a venture capitalist and is a founder CEO of Triangulate. He also worked for Bain, Cisco, and Microsoft. He holds an MBA from Harvard and a BS in computer science from University of North Carolina. On his spare time, he likes to build circuits with his three-year-old daughter, Anavi. He loves sailing and also piano. So please join me in welcoming Sunil tonight. Great. Oh, perfect. And uh, this microphone's on. Thank you, Anna. That was a wonderful introduction. Everyone, it's, uh, it's really a true honor for me to be here tonight. Uh, I'm excited to uh, convince you of one big idea over the course of our uh, next 45 minutes together. Um, as Anna said, Sunil Nagaraj with Ubiquity Ventures, and I'd like to think that um, the, the area that I focus on is a, a forward-looking area that I can inspire you with tonight. Uh, the goal uh, is to convince you that, uh, which, which before I share the goal, let me ask who's in the audience. So uh, if you wouldn't mind, would you raise your hand if you're an engineer? Hands up high and proud. Perfect. All right, hands down. And then if you're a business person, hands up high. And then if you're other. Oh, okay, meaningful amount of other. I don't think we have time to ask about the other. But um, So the goal tonight is to convince you of a few things. Um, first is that software is amazing, right? Uh, the way we build software is amazing. Uh, it is now moving beyond the screen. And I want to be really precise about that over the course of tonight's talk. And that this is a very, very, very big deal. Big deal for engineers, big deal for business folks, big deal for venture capitalists. This is, I think, uh, one of the most lucrative and impactful uh, opportunities that's in Silicon Valley right now. And if you look at it the wrong way, you'll see it as a, a trivial thing and get mixed up. But it, hopefully tonight I can inspire you with a different lens to look upon this new trend coming into our world called software beyond the screen. So uh, we'll get into the agenda in a second, but the, the, if you had the, the TLDR, uh, too long, didn't read version, is that software was on the big screen of a computer. It was then on a small screen of a phone. And now, like my venture capital firm's name, Ubiquity, it's showing up everywhere. Uh, the screens are shrinking, and this is a really big, powerful trend. So tonight's agenda, we'll talk about software in uh, very specific terms, what it is, why it's amazing, what it does for our world. I want to build up a framework that we can use to think about how software works and how it's built and, and how we've really refined this tool chain over almost 100 years. Humanity, society, Silicon Valley, we're really, really good at building software. Now, um, the, the next piece after that is we'll, we'll take this framework that we build up and then talk about how it can leap off of the screen, leave behind its ancestral chains of desktop computers and control alt delete and, and OLED screens and run in the real world. So. Um, to, to, to start that big journey, uh, I'll start with a very famous quote. Uh, and so this is why we're going to spend the first uh, little bit here talking about the journey of software. Uh, I realize that uh, I'm relatively uh, 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 young in the broader arc of Silicon Valley, so uh, I realize I'll get a few things wrong about the history, but if you'll bear with me, it's part of a broader story. So where did software come from? Um, my own connection to this is that I'm involved with the Computer History Museum. I founded and, and served as this chair of the Next Gen Board for the last 10 years. And uh, this is a fantastic place. I suspect many of you have been here. Uh, if you haven't, I would strongly encourage you to go. And don't go for an event. Go for to actually see the 25,000 square foot exhibit. Uh, a lot of the stuff in, in the next little few minutes will be inspired from my time um, at the Computer History Museum. Now, the, the, the thesis of this part is that every few years, every few decades, software looks different, is distributed differently, and it actually is built differently every few years. So, so what do I mean by that? 
So we'll start with uh, 1890, uh, the Hollow Earth machine. Uh, and this was software, right? This was the US census took too long to count by hand. So 1880 census took until I think 1888 or something like that. It took a long time before the census results were out. So the Hollow Earth machine, this software, is one where punch cards first really became, came into use in an electronic setting. The punch allowed electrical contacts to touch the plate and that ticked a counter. So that was the tabulation in this company. This company was called Calculating Calculation or Calculating, Tabulating and Recording, CTR. It's a company you've all heard of because later it, it became part of IBM. So this is sort of the very first IBM machine to think about. And, and here punch cards were the software. Later, uh, with ENIAC, uh, the software was actually wiring, right? And so these weren't ones and zeros in the normal sense of the word, but uh, uh, the, the um, six very famous women who were the ENIAC programmers set the knobs and set the wires to create the program. And these are important programs for our military effort, but this is what software looked like. It was coded differently. It was built differently. It was, uh, in a funny way, between the Hollow Earth machine and ENIAC, it was very much physical. And We've, we, uh, in, a, in about 30 minutes, we'll talk about how it's becoming physical again. It's kind of done a, an elegant round trip. Uh, we'll all, uh, I think many of us will remember this, uh, five and a quarter inch floppy disks, closing the little thing, sticking a ton of these every time you had to update DOS. Uh, and, 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 and then um, I, I want to go a little deeper here. So um, in 2003, I worked at Microsoft and I was involved in the software engineering effort. And, I, and I, that's my paradigm for how software used to be built in the recent past. So um, at Microsoft, uh, in 2003, I was working on Office as a, product, a program manager in Microsoft Office. And we would conceive of new features for Microsoft Word, things like Clippy or the Ribbon or things like that. Um, and we'd think about features and we'd code for about 12 months. So, so um, nothing new, just sit down and code, almost in a closet. Then we'd say code complete. It was actually an official word. Code complete, no new coding. And then for the next 12 months, we'd sit and test it. So hopefully you get this image of a very monolithic siloed process where you code for a while, you halt, and then you switch over, you test for uh, 12 months. Uh, actually the last like six months was just triaging to make sure your fixes didn't create other bugs. And then you cut the gold master, meaning the gold master of the CD-ROM, you release to manufacturing. These were these massive milestones in this delicate monolithic process before you put it into a cardboard box and shipped it. So that's what software looked like in this world. In 2003, there was a team called SQUIM, Software Quality Monitoring, and that was the first, the first inklings of analytics. We're going to talk about analytics a lot, but it was the first time, with your permission, the developer of software could understand how you're using it. It started to become a conversation. Uh, this disconnection, though, you know, 2003 is starting to be when software got connected. This is why you had these annoying 25 letter uh, uh, EULA codes and, and license keys, because there was no connection. I mean, it really drives home the point that software was built because, because uh, they knew best, and then it was put into a box and mailed to you and you installed it, but never the twain shall meet. The user and the developer should never meet. And this is how software was as recently as 2003. Uh, a little bit uh, farther along here, uh, let's see if my clicker will work. Uh, uh, the, the, this thing, not called the internet, the information superhighway was another uh, instance of software entering our world. At the time, there was a focus on information. This will be a way to retrieve information, to pull it down. Gopher, FTP, these technologies were going to let you pull down all the world's information at your fingertips. It was only much later that we started to talk about websites. And then this is what software looked like. Now, we're following this arc of software becoming a little more nimble, a little more communicative, as opposed to the wires of ENIAC. Uh, and, and these are the uh, screenshot homepages of Google GeoCities, which is homepage hosting, and uh, the first website for Netflix. Didn't have the red back then. So um, with, with that in mind, now we, we get to the world that, that we know fairly well when we think about software, apps. Uh, and this has been an, an elegant combination of cloud and local and connectivity and running the right software at the right place on these small devices, having it handy. And this has created an explosion. Uh, this was from WWDC where um, I got to uh, have a, a fantastic seat and take this great photo of Tim. The last slide right before this said 20 million application developers. It's arguably, you could say they're the most valuable company because of apps, because of this new way that software showed up. So uh, in, in a funny way, you could think about these little app icons versus the punch cards and the journey that software has made along the way. And that's sort of the baseline uh, that, that we're starting with uh, as we enter the, uh, the real discussion of software beyond the screen. So 
So with that in mind, let's talk about how software is built. Um, this is really what I mean when I say software is amazing. The, um, since, since ENIAC, the way that we have thought about software, designed it, there was the mythical man month from Frederick Books. He was uh, chairman of the computer science department at Chapel Hill, uh, which was effectively, we know the right way, we, we lock in the right way, and then we build it. it sounds kind of like my Microsoft experience in 2003 to eventually a more agile process. We'll talk about that, those tools that have been refined over 50 years, the way that we build software, and this is the singular powerful moment where we can take that 50 years of learning of how to build software properly and apply it to the real world. What do I mean by real world? I mean the real physical world. We'll talk more about that. So uh, this software development tool set uh, comprise, is comprised of three key categories. First is reuse. There's this Isaac Newton quote about standing on the shoulders of giants. It's a very, very big deal. This is how we're able to achieve as much as we can is that software fundamentally and the way that we've chosen to develop it allows us to build on top of what's already been built before. It's a very, very powerful idea, and we'll dive into that more in a second. Abstraction, uh, this is a funny way to express the problem, but abstraction says, I can worry about this, and other people will worry about that other stuff. It's a very powerful idea as well. Uh, and then finally, this notion of agile. Uh, if I'm trying to get there, I can make small changes uh, and, and get there, and, and we'll dive into that a lot. That's actually a, a critical part of software development in 2019. So on this first notion, uh, actually, yes, yeah, so, so, so combine these three, and you get great great software. So the first idea is, is around code reuse. So uh, what I mean by this, uh, I think about half the audience um, uh, said they were not engineers, is uh, it used to be when you were building software uh, that you would build everything from scratch. You would write every single line of code yourself, you would write it in a fairly low level language, thinking 1970s, 1980s, writing everything in C down to the bare metal, dropping into assembly every now and again in order to accomplish something. Uh, and even then, in theory, you were also already using the compiler, which is a layer of abstraction. But uh, you were starting at the beginning. Eventually, uh, this is in the developer ethos, uh, any time you wrote the same lines of code twice, so you're writing something here and you're writing something here, you actually, it's called refactoring, you take that code, put it in one place, and then you call it from both locations. So now you only have one copy of code. There's this other concept of DRY, don't repeat yourself. In, uh, in, in software development that's been around for a very long time. So refactoring was the first time it was reuse of my own stuff, right? So uh, the next piece was pulling in code snippets from other people. If you had a nice, uh, in high school I built a Tetris game and so someone had a nice way to turn off the cursor so I copied their, literally copy and paste three lines of assembly into my uh, C, C, C++ program and that was a code snippet. And that's a little bit more reuse. I'm not reusing my code, I'm reusing other people's code. Eventually this became includes and modules and libraries Eventually, we started to have library module networks. This is a very powerful idea. It doesn't really exist in a lot of other areas where if you build a really great image manipulation library, I'm t uh, programming something in Perl with two keystrokes, I can pull in your full module into my program. Now, there's a small nuance, uh, a negative nuance, but, but in general, this is an amazing thing that if it's open source or I have the right licenses, I can automatically pull in your code, I can pull in your work. It starts to point to software developers as code gluers, right? Connecting the dots between code as opposed to writing procedural lines one by one. The negative nuance I was alluding to uh, was that uh, if you made, uh, there's a popular image manipulation library called Image Magic on Linux. So if I pull in your uh, module, I pulled in the version on, uh, from September 12th. Now if next week you figure out a better manipulation or a new function, I don't get that because I pulled your module and it's, it's actually part of my code. I downloaded uh, a, 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 a language file or a compiled binary and included it in my program. So the next wave of, uh, I'm sorry about that, the next wave of reuse was actually the idea of APIs. Uh, and so this would be uh, cloud hosted production runtime usage APIs. It's a mouthful, but it's a critical piece here. So instead of me writing my program and I wrote every line, and instead of including someone's module in there in a monolithic fashion, my program is really a bunch of calls to other services. So Stripe is a great example, Auth0 is another example, Twilio is an example. If you've ever signed up for an app and you get a text saying please confirm, it, the people who wrote that app didn't figure out how to send you a text. At that moment in their program, they said twilio.send and it sent you a message and Twilio handled how to do that, what it took, Twilio charged the developer a fraction of a penny. So you're starting to spread out software development into more areas uh, with these live production calls. And this has actually been very um, attractive businesses. Several of these businesses have gone public um, uh, from the business perspective. But it, it does emphasize uh, building on the shoulders of giants, and this is how people can get time to market sooner and faster. 
Um, so that's the first piece of the three pieces that I mentioned. The second piece is abstraction. Uh, my computer science professor back in, at, at Chapel Hill said almost everything in the world can be solved with the level of redirection or abstraction. And the idea is any problem is more tractable when it's smaller. Any problem in the world, any domain you're talking about. And how do you shrink a problem? Well, you, you kind of slice it in half or you parcel off a piece for someone else to worry about. Uh, you, uh, this is a, a, a very common concept in many areas of life, but in software development, it's been huge. Um, there is this notion called the OSI model, uh, which illustrates this pretty well. So uh, the idea is that the internet works, and if you want to make a website, you make a website, you put it up, you don't have to figure out how Wi-Fi works, you don't have to figure out how Ethernet works, how TCP IP works, how network cards work. You have your website, let's call it an HTML payload, you put it into an envelope. That envelope, it goes into another envelope, goes into another envelope, and at each layer, someone else is figuring out how to deliver that envelope. So in this particular instance, Ethernet cable sends it over to the other computer, and that Ethernet card opens up the envelope, and now the Windows, program, Windows uh, TCP stack opens up that envelope, and then Netscape Navigator or Google Chrome open up that envelope. And so that's where you get this image of, of the uh, OSI, Open Systems Interconnect framework, and, and this is core to how the internet works. Uh, and, and the critical piece here, everyone doesn't need to figure out everything. Remember how I said software was built years ago? You get to just worry about your little piece. That's why I call abstraction, that's not my problem. I really want to work on the networking layer and build a big company like Juniper Networks just at that layer. But I don't have to worry that much about what's above me or what's below me. This has been really, really powerful for allowing people to shine at what they're good at. And, uh, and we'll start to talk about, I think here, yeah, it's already coming up, uh, that in order for this to work, imagine this envelope system, if you really want to run with that analogy for a second, the bigger envelope has to know how big the smaller envelope is. So if FedEx is carrying the bigger envelope, they have a weight limit, they have a size limit, and you can't fit anything bigger or smaller inside. So at some point, there are contracts between these different components or these different layers of the stack. That's like me saying, Whenever I call you and leave you a voicemail, I promise I will say what it's about and when to call me back. There's a contract between us. In programming speak, this used to be header files in C++ where you expose an object. Uh, in in uh, uh, OSI stack, there's uh, very specific um, byte sizes and frame sizes, literally like an envelope. Uh, with APIs, there's a very specific way to talk to the API. So when you call Twilio to ask it to send a message, there's a very specific way you speak. Uh, but this layer of abstraction has been critical uh, on the software level, but also then between teams and people, and this is what's led to microservices. So microservices at this moment in Silicon Valley is a very popular idea, and I believe the, the, the critical piece here is in a team of 100 engineers, 15 can go build something, and they don't have to worry that much what the other teams do. Each chunk of code is kind of wrapped around in a microservice, and there's a contract, here's what I want, here's what I'm gonna get. I don't care how you do it, when you do it. If you like Python, write it in Python. If you like C Sharp, write it in C Sharp. Silicon Valley had two, two, two spaces, four spaces for your indentures. Whatever it is, you get to work in your own way on your own stuff and microservices allows it to be compartmentalized and sort of, uh, but still adhere to this contract. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, this contract effectively, uh, effectively uh, creates standardization. So this is what allows us to, to speed up. The last piece here is, um, is Agile, which is actually the most important piece of the puzzle here. Um, I think of this as uh, 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 fundamentally rejecting the notion that you know the right answer when you get started. Right? That's what Agile's about. If you know the right answer, don't bother with this. If you already know the right answer, go ahead and invest a billion dollars and go chase it. Uh, but we have better tools now to do this. Specifically, we can use the scientific method to build software. And that means uh, test, measure, and improve. Test, measure, and improve. It's really test and measure and scientific method, but improve so you get another swing. And so there's this notion of uh, doing a project and you're going through time, and at some point you have uh, a certain amount of information you know about the project. Imagine a six month project, you're building a new app. You know a little bit about what people want. You know a little bit about how it might be used. And over time, you'll know more and more. I don't think anyone would disagree with this first line. Uh, the second line, though, is how important your decisions are. At the very beginning of a project, when you do it normally, it's really important decisions, but you know so little about the problem. There's this gigantic mismatch, and this is how all software has been built up, up until recently, where you make critical architectural decisions, how many servers, what uh, devices are you gonna support, what file formats, how many engineers are you gonna resource, but you know almost nothing about it. With Agile, and with this lightweight course correction, 
it's a little conceptual, but you can flip your line so that your decisions are actually small at the beginning while you know small amounts. It's a really, really big idea that Agile lets you align your decision making and resource allocation with your amount of knowledge of the problem. Uh, this is data-driven iteration, uh, stage deployment, a very, very powerful idea. And, and in case you, you, you can't guess where this is going, all of these ideas apply to smart hardware and software in the real world. But stage deployment is this notion that um, when Facebook has a new feature, uh, let's say um, those uh, 3D photos, they can roll it out to 0.1% of their users today, see how it goes. Next week, roll it out to 1% of their users. Next week, roll it out to 10% of their users. That is not at all how the real world works. When you buy a Toyota Camry and there's a new, uh, bigger screen, all 2019 cameras get that, get that new upgrade. But this notion of stage deployment allows for demand testing, allows for robustness testing, uh, and it's a really powerful method, uh, a really powerful component of Agile. Now, um, Agile is possible, newly possible. It wasn't possible in the 60s or the 80s uh, or even the 2000s, um, largely because the cost of iteration is so low now. What does that mean? That means if you're building an app, you can push a new update for free, right? You just go home, edit at 2 a.m. for an hour your, your Objective-C, build it, push it to Apple, and it's free. That is the opposite of my experience at Microsoft in 2003. I'm picking on Microsoft, but it's endemic of the whole industry where you had to burn a new gold master, make a whole bunch of new cardboard boxes, put them in the mail, and send them out. So this is a new technique in software, and it's made possible through a few things, but primarily this iteration cost. So uh, why does this matter for software? And in about a minute, we're going to switch over to, to software beyond the screen. This is how I think about um, startups and entrepreneurs. So I think of um, there being a forest. You're in the forest. Um, uh, uh, you, you see trees here. You see trees here. I can't see what's behind this tree until I step over here. So I have to move to see the next tree. Uh, and I'm trying to find my cabin. Right? It's the middle of the night. I got very, very lost and I'm trying to find my cabin. This is an entrepreneur searching for product market fit, searching for the billion dollar exit. They have this fantastic idea in the middle. Now, if they're doing this and, uh, and, 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 and they get a, a, a friend who calls them and tells them, you know, hey, you're hot or cold once a year, what's gonna happen? Are they ever gonna find their cabin? Probably not. Now, if their friend calls them every day and says hot or cold, or their friend calls them every hour, or their friend calls them every minute, right? A friend telling you every minute, every step I take will basically be along the right path. And that's what Agile is about to me, and that's what the business impact is for me, is that this allows startups and entrepreneurs to find product market fit authentically in a much more rapid fashion without having to go 20 feet the wrong direction. That's the same as a startup burning $100 million and then sort of pivoting afterwards. Agile lets you stay within bounds as you're hunting the way out of the forest. Um, Another uh, uh, a hope uh, is that if we have better uh, hot cold signals to get out of the forest, you might start to be more confident about entering forests. You might go into bigger forests. Not exactly sure what that means in terms of how, uh, how we directly translate it to software. Maybe you go after bigger opportunities, hairier opportunities, because you have this utility tool belt, right? That's really what this, today's whole talk is about, is this software utility belt is really powerful, and you'd, you'd, you'd be able to approach bigger problems now that you have Agile. So uh, what does this mean? Uh, there are some business uh, implications of software's uh, elegance. Um, uh, there are uh, uh, different business models. Um, one is where you buy something once and it gets better. Like that sentence never existed up until a few years ago. Right? Like just like my book has to reboot or my car is, uh, is, getting, uh, uh, is um, updating its OS, right? But like you never, ever, ever bought something and it got better, like uh, parentheses for free. Uh, and so uh, this was just on my Facebook thing I was scrolling by. Even if you don't plan on buying a new iPhone, you'll get a bunch of new features. And that's like a crazy idea. And it's a lot of features and it's a lot of development. And it's because of this underlying business model uh, where software can be deployed and you can generate revenue off of it. There's subscription business models, uh, not even things like Netflix, but even Adobe Photoshop, right? 25 years it's been out there, but now you can pay 10 bucks a month and subscribe to Photoshop Creative Cloud, um, as I do. Uh, and then even um, other business models where you can um, uh, uh, pay for something five bucks and then decide to pay for other stuff later. Um, to me, what this really does is it, uh, it does a few things. I want to talk about this, sec this bottom bullet here. It actually aligns interests. So rather than asking someone to pay 50 bucks at Office Depot for the next version of Office, or is it probably more like 200 bucks, or 50 bucks for Doom, uh, without knowing what it's like, without knowing if you'll like it, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's more like you get to step your 
step forward with your, your imposition of asking for money as you step forward by offering more value. Right? This is a really big deal with software that you can align these two things. Um, uh, in, in my uh, uh, experience, this is what um, enabled uh, free-to-play games. So a lot of uh, desktop hardcore gaming was you pay up front. Uh, there, was a comp uh, there were several companies. Uh, one of them was League of Legends, uh, 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 Riot Games, that created League of Legends free to play, and then you pay as you, as you like later. And because of that, uh, there was a massive business opportunity. So Twitch was an investment of mine at my old firm, and Twitch is a, a place where you can go to watch people play video games. Little crazy when you first hear it, if you've never heard of it before, people also watch people play football, people watch people play poker. But the reason Twitch was a billion dollar exit to Amazon was that for the first time, video game developers cared if you played their game. For the first time, someone who built something cared if you used it. That's another gigantic deal, and it didn't exist until a few years ago. If normally I sell you this remote, ah, I'm done. I'm going to go off and do something, but I didn't generate more revenue if you used it more. With free-to-play video games, for the first time, if you showed someone how to play the game, if you inspired them to get to level 62 by watching Twitch, then you would actually generate more revenue. And this is a key part of why Twitch was such a big successful exit, even though Twitch isn't exactly software beyond the screen or updatable software itself. So um, lots of implications. Um, we'll, we'll now switch gears and start to talk about smart hardware. So at this point, uh, my hope is that you're armed with this utility belt. You know how to think about software. You know how, well, hopefully you are in full agreement that it's amazing and we've come, made massive strides and we're really, really good at building software. We're really, really bad at building hardware, by the way, if that wasn't obvious. But this is, this is sort of the next wave. And so we already talked about this, this idea that software is sort of shrinking its screen. That's one empirical way, a tactical way to think about it. A different way, we talked about these three tools, but the headline changes. So it's no longer the software development tool set has become well honed along the way. It's the software tool development tool set is the hardware development tool set. Really, really big deal. I usually like to think about this is that the software development tool set can now be the tool set for building everything, everything in the world. Uh, and that means that powerful tools don't just enable great software, they enable great smart hardware, great hardware. Um, so um, let's talk about criteria for identifying smart hardware. Um, I, I bet many of you could now repeat this back to me, but, but the core idea is that you want to see if it follows this pattern of test, measure, modify. Um, it's a little trivial, but this chair does not follow that pattern. This chair was built once based on intuition. The person who built it doesn't care if it works that well, and they don't even know if there's bugs. Uh, uh, and so uh, bugs meaning the table always slams sideways because they didn't get the thing right. Maybe 25 years from now, these chairs will be replaced and we'll get it. So imagine that development cycle. But in this case, if we can find stuff where you test, uh, and the way you test is by having different settings and knobs that you can play with. Imagine a Tesla, how they can change the speed of the uh, inverter, so the electrical draw of the inverter, in order to make it go 2.8 or 2.6 seconds. They can fiddle with things. The, the, uh, a Tesla can also change whether they're pushing on the brake. So Tesla noticed that when you are on a uh, negatively inclined hill, leaning backwards on a hill at a stop sign, uh, the way Teslas roll, it's kind of like a manual car. So when you let go of the brake, the Tesla would kind of fall back and then people would slam on the accelerator, kind of like a new person with the manual stick drive. So Tesla noticed that with their analytics. They then pushed out an update so that whenever you had a negative tilt, it would hold the brake for three seconds extra. Right? Like that is fundamentally different than everything else physical in this real world. So uh, in order to have software be on the screen or smart hardware, you want to have settings. You want to have the ability to see how people are using that product. And then you want to be able to push out updates. This is the uh, 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 virtuous feedback loop that drives smart hardware to look like software. This is why software can accelerate in a fantastic pace. So the question to ask yourself, if you ever see something in the real world, uh, does it have settings, analytics, and updates? Settings, analytics, updates. Now the reason I harp on this particular point is that many people will confuse gadgets with smart hardware. So if you have a coffee mug that heats up by itself, you buy it on Kickstarter. You might say, oh, that's smart hardware. But does it have settings, analytics, and updates? Right? How much do they know about how I'm using the product? Are they using that to thoughtfully refine, probably in Jira or Trello or Pivotal, their Agile Scrum stories, and then pushing out updates as a result? No. And so that's not smart hardware. Uh, and so uh, the critical piece is, does it feel like a loop? Does it feel like a loop? And that's how you can tell smart hardware from other things. Um, so uh, with that in mind, um, I think we can um, start to dive into 
some examples. So um, let's see. One of the examples, we'll, we'll talk about a few, and then um, we'll see how time goes. Uh, we might switch to Q&A right after that. So um, I'll start by telling you about, um, ah, there we go, put it to sleep. So I'll, I'll start by telling you about a company, uh -oh, uh, about a company called Halter. So Halter uh, is an investment of uh, my venture capital from Ubiquity. Uh, Halter uh, has a $50, $100 smart hardware collar that looks maybe about as big as my hand. It goes onto the neck of a dairy cow, right? So this is software in the real world. This is software in the cows. We're going to talk about software in hospitals and software in space in a minute. But software on cows. So uh, why would you want to put software on cows? Does it have settings, analytics, and updates? The um, answer is yes, 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 yes. So it turns out if you had better control, monitoring and control, control is a critical word here, you could actually increase how many, much milk comes off of your pasture dairy farm and reduce the amount of staff. So Halter has this collar that's able to physically move dairy cows uh, through the use of sound and vibration. So I'll, um, uh, this is a fun 60 second video which I'll play uh, and it'll give you a sense of how it works. on the cows, uh, they have solar panels, and this company dabbles with hardware because they can experiment with lightweight things. They obviously use things like 3D printing, and they're um, able to trigger the herding of cows, trigger virtual fences, uh, all from your iPad. So imagine setting a digital fence by walking around, pushing a button, walking around, pushing a button. So this is what I mean by software coming into the real world, and it often uses smart hardware. These folks are able to experiment in an agile fashion. We talk about releasing every couple of days. Right? In the hardware world, that's, that's virtually unheard of. And then we have this um, cute van with a bunch of cameras to study the cows to watch for patterns. We can correlate IMU motion data with video capture data and start to predict what the cows are doing and how they're feeling. So um, Halter is, um, is one example of that, and their logo is a, is a, is a, is a PCB trace. So. Um, uh, that gives you one sense, and, and so the, the thing to think about here is uh, does it have uh, settings, right? And so with Halter, we can change the battery usage, we can change the vibration strength, we can gather more data or less data. Uh, does it have analytics? Uh, lots of analytics. So through LoRa and Cellular, we're able to transmit data back from every cow. And does it have updates? Uh, absolutely. So with Halter, uh, the, the, the secret plan, get it out there see how people are using it, and then add more features and fix features. And so it'll, employ, it'll embody a lot of the characteristics I talked about with revenue, too, that will have a, uh, a, a uh, it's tricky to say the word honest, but a more honest business model because we'll charge for things as we deliver things. Right? It's very different than buying, again, go back to thinking about buying a piece of box software. You don't know what's inside, but you've got to pay for it all up front. Halter is a SaaS-based pricing model. Um, there's another um, example of this. Um, so um, taking software into, um, taking software into hospitals. So uh, Diligent uh, Robotics um, has a human-sized robot on wheels that is actually able to um, navigate hospital hallways and be really helpful. What does it help with? Well, it helps with all the things that nurses don't want to do, the menial tasks that happen in hospitals so that nurses can perform at the top of their license, so nurses can actually have more patient care. So uh, again, to visualize it, and again, as you watch this video, think about the things that we, um, that we uh, talked about are sort of the tests. So again, it looks like a nice, you know, injected mold, molded plastic robot with an arm and a, uh, sensors and batteries, but really it's software rolling down the hallway. Because it has settings, because it has things you can tweak, there are rich analytics passed back to its developer, and it's able to get updates. So it can improve over time, it can offer real concrete value. And so these sorts of smart hardware businesses uh, can be mischaracterized if you look at this and say, oh, that's hardware, I don't like hardware. Right? If you really see it for what it is, Agile, Scrum, uh, uh, bug testing, and things like that, and improvements, you, you sort of start to view it in a different lens. So uh, the last uh, example I'll um, talk about before we switch into sort of a few more implications, and then we'll take questions, is uh, Rocket Lab. So um, is anyone here into uh, the rocket world at all? Hands up. 
okay, a few folks just being in Silicon Valley with Lockheed and things like that in the area. Um, so it turns out um, if you think software is great for, for little things, but big things, that, that's not agile and scrum. You can't mess around with big things. And I mean big things like skyscrapers, bridges, rockets. Uh, it turns out Rocket Lab has proven that wrong. So uh, in most rockets, the most complicated part of a rocket is something called a turbo pump. Uh, it's not totally accurate, but the, the, the thing it does is the hardest part of a rocket. It takes fuel, really quickly throws it into the combustion chamber. So uh, every other rocket that's launched to orbit has had a mechanical turbo pump. What does that mean? It means it's a bunch of steel, it's a bunch of hardware that operates at the hardware iteration speed. So if you want to change the way most rockets work, you have to disassemble it, go back to the metal shop, turn on your lathe and machine a new piece, go back to your rocket, turn it on again. Now you can imagine the iteration speed that that's involved with. Rocket Lab has the world's first 3D printed electric turbo pump. So instead of a, uh, a gas-fed turbo pump, mechanical turbo pump, instead of a bunch of really good gears that are physical, uh, that, that are triggered by uh, combustion, ours are more like the motor in a Tesla. Right? It's a, 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 an electric motor. Now that sounds like a tiny difference, but to me, uh, this is, to me, the whole reason the company's been so successful. Now, why is that? Is because it's software beyond the screen. It doesn't look like software beyond the screen, but it is. This electric turbo pump runs code. This electric turbo pump runs code. So now, when they're building it, or when they're trying to improve it, it has settings, it has analytics, and it gets updates. Really, really powerful. This company is now a unicorn uh, because of this, of this trend that they can actually iterate with lines of C++. While everyone is over there playing with, a, not playing with, using a machine, uh, a metal lathe, uh, these folks can change a variable in C++ and try it again. And change another variable in C++, that means type two letters and hit enter and try it again. So speed of iteration is how Rocket Lab was able to go from, uh, that picture on the right was um, in 2014, they had, they had um, turned on one engine for two or three seconds, it's called a hot fire test, to making it to orbit successfully in 2017. So today there's only two companies on Earth, two private companies that successfully go to orbit, SpaceX and Rocket Lab, and it's because of software beyond the screen. Um, I will uh, top that off with the nice uh, promo video from Rocket Lab. In all stations, this is flight on mission cord. We're starting terminal count this time. This is 2017, their Flight first launch T out of New Zealand. 12 minutes, Mark T minus This is a six story rocket that launches something about as big as me. FSO to orbit. FC on mission code. Have you confirm? Confirm. FTS, confirm FTF is green. FTS is green on internal power. Again, it looks like a rocket, but it's really software. It gets updates, it sends a ton of analytics EMS, actually. FC on mission code. And this is on a peninsula confirm. in New Zealand. Confirmed. That's Peter Beck, the CEO. So this is May of 2017. Release of the T minus two-hour balloon. RMLC on Envicode. Commence fire suppression system test. Stage two locks pressed. Flight vehicle is ready. T minus ten seconds. It's like a kid in a candy store. Peter back happy with his first uh, successful launch. Now the way to think about this without going into numbers is Rocket Lab spent 10 times less, maybe 100 times less than any other rocket company has spent to get to space. Why? Because they were working in software. It was the software problem. The quicker you can turn something into a software problem and use our well-honed software development toolkit, really big deal. So um, I'll, uh, I'll touch on a few, um, I won't call them examples, but a few, interesting, uh, a, a, a few interesting news tidbits that are tied to our world. Uh, and now we have this new lens. I really hope I've equipped you with a different lens to look at this. Um, there was a hurricane a few years ago in Florida. Tesla has a, uh, uh, at the time, a Model S 85, I mean 85 kilowatt hours, how much energy is uh, stored in, inside of the car. Uh, and a Model S, uh, I think it was 60 and 40. Um, 
Uh, and so uh, maybe uh, 80, 60, and 40. And so um, 80, 70, and 60. I think that's what it was. 80, 70, and 60. And so uh, you might think they have three cars. They have three models, three physical different variations. No. They actually had two variations. They had one with an 80 kilowatt hour battery pack and one with a 70, a 70 kilowatt hour battery pack. Uh, this is to simplify their supply chain. So they could just have two kinds of cars. And then with software, they could make the 70 kilowatt hour battery car look like a 60 kilowatt hour battery car. So then this hurricane comes up. Many people have the 60, the 70, the 80. Tesla, uh, uh, who knows uh, if it's um, um, as, to, as to the long term why, but I think this was great for the world and great for marketing. They sent a single command over the air, and now all the Tesla 60, Model S 60s, suddenly had Model S 70 capabilities. This is crazy, right? I mean, I talked about rebooting your book and, and, and waiting for your car to update, but now you thought your car could, could go 2.8, you know, 0 to 60 in 2.8, now it's 2.6. That you kind of expected, but this is unexpected, right? Stuff in the real world can change, hope, usually, hopefully, for the better. Uh, without you even asking and, and at the, at the uh, impetus or whim of a company, right? So this is the new world of software beyond the screen. Um, it's, um, we have some space folks here, but uh, most people don't know, when we launch things to Mars these days, we launch a physical thing, like a rover, the, the um, Mars Science Laboratory is about as big as a Hummer vehicle. We launch it and then it takes, because of the way Hellman transfers and orbital dynamics work, it takes like nine months to get there. So we could, if we put on our hardware hat, we finish it, we put it up, we tie it in a rocket, we launch it, we're done. We kind of wipe our hands and go, go chill for nine months. It's not at all what we do. We launch the Mars Science Laboratory, and then we keep working on the software for another eight and a half months. It's like a kid cramming for the midterm right before, but it's actually a great idea. We get to continue building stuff, and then what do we do? We push a button, send the over-the-air updates all the way to Mars. It takes nine months to get there, but it takes uh, just a few minutes to transmit at light speed. So we're able to send software after the fact. Um, very, very big deal in this software uh, beyond the screen. Something to think about is, I don't know the answer to this, what does a blue screen of death look like in a software beyond the screen world? Uh, I think about this with Halter. You know, what, what could go wrong where we send the cows the wrong direction? What could go wrong with autonomous vehicles? We've seen some of that already. Uh, but um, something we need to watch out for. Uh, and what new opportunities, you know, as a venture capitalist, I'm, I'm looking for opportunities to um, help uh, companies that are well positioned. Uh, firmware bugs were something that people didn't talk a whole lot about two or three years ago. Uh, that's when I invested in Eclipsium in their seed round. Uh, and now, uh, over the last year, we've heard things about super micro, Intel Spectre meltdown, code execution bugs, low level bugs. Great example. Uh, many of you probably have a conference call unit like a polycom in your office. If somebody hacked that, they could make it look like it's muted even though it's not muted they could listen to your whole day. So firmware bugs are a real thing in this world of software beyond the screen. Turns out when, when Polycom, this may be true already, allow you to get over their updates, it allows hacker to do, hackers to do over their updates. So this new world demands a, a new tool chain. Uh, and, and maybe the last idea, which might be more personal, my house, we have a ton of these Hue bulbs. Uh, Hue bulbs are software powered light, right? Software powered light where uh, I put these in, they uh, transmit, uh, each bulb transmits over Zigbee back to the hub that has ethernet or Wi-Fi backhaul. So now I can push a button from any number of remotes or from my phone and make different things happen with the lights. Now, what happens if Philips discontinues this Hue line? My lights stop working, right? It's not quite the blue screen of death, but more and more parts of our lives will just stop working, right? We're okay with Napster shutting down or some other software website going out of business, but what about when our, if our chair stops working, right? So there's, there's this, uh, lots of interesting uh, tidbits to think through as we approach this. So in summary, I hope I've convinced you of this, that software really, really is amazing. The way we build it has, has made massive strides. It's moving beyond the screen. It's a big deal. I hope I've armed you with uh, a few ways to think about it, that software really depends on reuse, abstraction, and agility. That's how 2019 we're able to build such great software so quickly. Uh, and then when we think about uh, smart hardware, if we want to know, is this a gadget or is this smart hardware, ask yourself, does it have settings that can be dials and knobs that can be changed? like the 60 kilowatt hour battery versus the 70 kilowatt hour battery? Does it send analytics back to its creator and is that creator able to push out updates? Then you know it's smart hardware and then you know it's got a lot more potential. Uh, I'll put my email address at the bottom here, so I, I do hope you'll reach out. Um, I'm always open to talk over email and, and meet and talk about um, technical topics like this or your ideas. And with that, maybe I'll um, open it up for a Q&A. Thanks so much, Sunil. So we have about 10 more minutes for Q&A. Um, I have an, uh, 
a microphone on the other side in here. So just raise your hand and we'll, one of us will come. So thank you very much for your time. Thinking about <clears throat> AI-based edge computing and moving into the hospital with that. So that's a, a ripe area for the exact iterative approach that you're talking about. And the FDA is likely going to figure out how they're going to accommodate that, those type of OTA updates. Um, so where do you think that's headed in medicine? Uh, that's a great question. So um, uh, I'll repeat the question as, as I interpret it. Um, there's, there's two big trends buried in this. One is, is AI where software can do amazing things, often where we can't understand why these black box neural networks where you don't understand the, the explainability is tricky. And then the notion of over there updates where something you buy can change in your hands, right? Like this water bottle could turn into this ridiculous example, but what if it changed before I even knew it? I didn't approve it, I, didn't I wasn't comfortable with that. Um, that's a really great question. I think we have a lot of things to figure out in that domain. Um, most areas where you're seeing smart hardware are totally unregulated or they're flaunting regulation. Uh, Tesla would be an example for a little while that they sort of just plot ahead and then figure it out later. Um, healthcare, I think it's, uh, one of many areas where we can't afford a blue screen of death, right? We can't afford us uh, bricking your pacemaker. Uh, even pacemakers, by the way, are not secure with wireless transmissions. And so Eclipsium is, is one of the good level. Another one of my companies helps to secure that. But I think we have to, um, it's, it's uncharted territory is the short answer. So I don't actually have a great answer as to how we should proceed, but this is exactly what we're figuring out at this moment. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, th there's a, a related notion that when will we be comfortable with autonomous vehicles if they um, kill people at the same rate as humans versus, you know? Uh, and so it's, it's very tough to tell. And, and there's a whole host of thoughts on who do you blame? You know, the device driver, manufacturer, the engineer level two, engineer level, when so many people build the things in our world. So all uncharted territory, and this is what we should explore. Yes. Hi, my name is Petra. So I see this in various industries, healthcare being one of them, agriculture, as I said, but I also see the dependency on um, utilities, on general utilities. So I don't live in Silicon Valley, I live here in the mountains. Uh, so which means that my dependency on internet is somewhat different than in Silicon Valley. And when I go into different states, into the middle of Montana, it's also different. So the dependency to use it really depends on what kind of infrastructure you have. What is your view on to the government then also kind of rethink what is the basic that every citizen or resident of that country should provide? Yeah. Does that mean that when we take this as our future, that means that internet for everybody needs to be mandatory? Power for everybody needs to be mandatory? Yeah. Does that come as a second step? No, this is a really great question. Um, there, there have been lots of net neutrality debates um, along this domain as to how, how internet companies and pipes and, and things should be regulated. Um, I don't know um, definitively, um, but it does feel like uh, the, the trend you're talking about, that as these things become more critical to our world, they should be treated as more critical to our world, regulated as such, and, um, and funded as such. So I, I do think that's, that's powerful, and I think um, in order to prevent a digital divide, which is already there, but from widening, we want these things to happen as well. So there are some um, uh, there are some bridge technologies where you sort of leapfrog things. Um, 5G, for example, may obsolete the need to put down fiber down to every rural home, for example. Uh, so uh, hopefully, technology in other domains will help us to, to catch up. But I do think that this vision is inevitable. I think it's powerful and lucrative and uh, demands uh, 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 sorry, not demands, but we should choose to make it uh, universally accessible if we can. Thank you for your presentation. Um, with all these systems becoming more prevalent and more critical, and you know the example you provided, like a blue screen of death, 
Do you think it's feasible to have, uh, not have key parts of the system be open so it can be monitored and, you know, uh, like the open source and open uh, source for both software and hardware pieces for key parts of it and still have them be secure? Uh, that's a great question. So um, can we, uh, for these important things or things that we build that become more important, how do we ensure people have comfort? Can we open up elements of it? There is um, some precedent in the security world uh, when, when certain companies buy security products, they'll demand that a key piece of it be open source so that they can be inspected and make sure there's no back doors. Um, I hope that could be a one model for going forward, that companies building this could uh, uh, either, uh, open source usually means everybody in the world, but could offer it to their customers for full code review or inspection, or to the public and then retain certain elements. As long as they can retain a profitable business model, they may be able to open up uh, portions of their code for inspection or uh, uh, releasing them for others to use. Um, and so I think we'll see more of that. I do think that's an important piece of the puzzle that as we rely more on these stacks, these technical stacks, all the different code components that are proprietary, we put more and more trust into a black box, whether that's a company or an AI. So in the AI world, there's explainability and 20 startups are chasing that right now. And then hopefully over here, I haven't seen any great examples yet um, within smart hardware, but I do think that's an important piece of the puzzle. I agree with you. Okay. It's been about 24 years since I've been at Park regularly. Um, back then I was used as a tester to sit there and break the software, not knowing how it could be broken. This was a very early example of an approach to try to validate and test things. Throw the stupid people at it, make the dumb mistakes. Could we not have, as part of the development of the intelligent hardware and the smart, smart hardware, develop the new modules of testing such that it's not released into the vital areas yeah. until it's gone through yeah. a known set of tests and we continually develop that test? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, so uh, so uh, as I understand it, in software testing, there's black box testing and white box testing. So black box testing, you don't know what's inside the program. You just try a whole bunch of stuff. In the agile world, you create test suites, which are to say a set of tests you run after every change. So you make up hundreds of tests. And then every night when you do a new code change, before you send it to the world, on Gmail, on normal software. You run it through these regression tests to make sure you didn't break something when you're trying to add something. Um, I, I'm not totally familiar with the larger smart hardware developer companies today, how they manage over their updates. I do know they mess it up sometimes. You'll get an update on a Hue bulb or on a Sonos speaker, and the next day you'll get another update. It's because they, they didn't do uh, something right. It may not have been stage deployment, may have introduced a bug. Um, <clears throat> if uh, I think we have time, I can mention <clears throat> one version of that that's in my own portfolio. So autonomous vehicles are smart hardware. We want to know they're safe, but at the same time we'd like to capture the benefits of Agile. I think you would agree with that. We'd love for uh, cars uh, to continually improve, but I don't want to put uh, my daughter Anavi in a, in a car where somebody finished the code last night and ran home really quick, right? I want to, I want to feel good uh, about the testing. And so one of the companies that I've invested in, and I have the video here handy, uh, is a company called Parallel Domain. So what Parallel Domain is, is a company that does photorealistic procedural content generation to uh, uh, bigger words to create virtual worlds. Now these worlds, you can practice your self-driving car software inside of. So there's simulation environments that are parameterized. So you can say, I want more clouds or less clouds, more potholes or less potholes. And you can feed this into your AV software. So I have a vision that every autonomous vehicle car company, when their engineers go home at night and their build server is cranking through the latest updates, it runs their AV software a billion miles through Parallel Domain's world. So I'll show you a, a short video, and this doesn't have sound, so I can talk while we're doing this. But again, these were uh, no human intervention, all generated with code. Uh, these are running at, I think, 3x speed. But uh, uh, identical looking world so we can give our AV software some practice. You were talking about sort of banging it up against stuff. This is one version. You can do this uh, somewhat randomly, or maybe you notice that your car always messes up when someone cuts into the lane in front of you. So you want to try that scenario a million times at 2 a.m., at 5 a.m. Then, if, if anyone's familiar with the machine learning aspects of autonomous vehicles, you want to give it the answer key. So a, a lot of machine learning is labeled training data. So we can actually, because it's synthetic, we can trace every car, we can tell this autonomous vehicle software the direction of every pixel in the frame because it's synthetic. We can tell it where the sidewalk is. 
Uh, and then um, we can feed all these different frame buffers into the machine learning algorithm. That's for training, but, but this company is uh, also focused on testing. So it's one version of that. I don't know what that looks like for most smart hardware yet. Um, I think uh, in the back. Yeah. I'm an old guy, and in our day, we always look for the weakest link. And it would seem to me that the weakest link is America's electrical grid and the possibility of catastrophic failure is pretty high. Mm -hmm. So I wish I were going to be around to see this fantastic new world, but if in fact we do get a catastrophic failure, all of this goes to hell. Mm -hmm. uh, can you make any provision for something like that? It's a great question. Um, uh, I'll, I'll um, go one level different. So instead of electricity, I'll talk about like cellular. So many autonomous vehicles have a cellular backhaul. That is to say, when the car is driving, it's transmitting usage analytics. If the car gets stuck, it phones home, and someone at a desk can teleoperate it from home. So that demands, just like you're saying, elect, you know, uh, reliable electricity is, is, a, is a prerequisite for this vision. So is reliable connectivity. So I know of several autonomous vehicle companies that are operating in, in smaller environments, constrained environments, that are putting up their own cell towers. Right? They don't want to rely on Verizon or AT&T or too many people at a sports game bogging down the cellular network. So they're creating parallel infrastructure for their contained, um, contained arena of operation. So in your uh, specific electricity case, I don't know if this is feasible, but lots of generators to replace and having a parallel electrical grid or something like that for certain use cases, I don't think that's feasible. But I am seeing other companies sort of, uh, in this case, it would be if I don't like Xerox Park's Wi-Fi, I put up my own Wi-Fi hotspots with my own Ethernet backhaul to my own fiber, right? Like, so a parallel network to, to arrive at that same SLA, service level uh, agreement or availability. Uh, that is demanded by the application if you can't rely on the current infrastructure. So one model, but I don't think it's great for electricity. We'll take one last question. Okay, perfect. Uh, hey, Sunil. Uh, great uh, presentation. Um, so uh, what I was thinking about is, um, and you know, you, uh, you've probably worked with a ton of entrepreneurs uh, at your VC firm, but uh, does it make sense for entrepreneurs to pursue problems with an inherent, uh, like it's kind of in your face, the, the, the software beyond, beyond the screen concept of settings, uh, analytics, and updates? Or uh, for, like especially in software problems, it's you know, kind of obvious, but for problems that require hardware or like user inter interaction with hardware, um, do you have a methodology that entrepreneurs can use to help them get to this mm -hmm. uh, software beyond the screen concept? Um, yeah, I wouldn't call it a methodology because it, it's a relatively simple statement, but, but try to use as little hardware as possible, right? I mean, the part of this vision here is uh, you want um, software is going to leap off of my screen. It can't run in thin air, so I need a little tiny physical substrate. So one of my investments, my old firm, was Tile, the lost and found. It's a tiny little thing you put on your keychain. The collar on the cow is the smallest. Uh, so you want as little as possible, if you can avoid it, to simplify ca uh, capital expenditure capex, to simplify iteration, moving parts. So uh, it's a funny, um, uh, almost a contradiction that I, I, I'm talking about smart hardware, but I want as little hardware as possible, as few moving parts. And you want to get back into the software domain as quickly as possible. So that's because that's really where you get your leverage and speed. So thank you, everyone, very much. I appreciate your time today. Thanks so much, Sunil. So uh, Joe was going to put up the next uh, forum that we have, which is actually on October 3rd. It is um, Democratizing and Modernizing STEM Education. We have one of our Park alum uh, from Microsoft coming to talk about that. And then afterwards, uh, later on in the month, we actually have the father of open innovation, Henry Chesbro, who's going to have a conversation with our CEO, Tolga Kurtoglu. So be on the lookout on our website for the registration for those uh, park forums.